So you're sitting down to read through the Psalms. And naturally you need to set the mood with some type of music. But not just any type of music. I'm talking about creating a perfectly designed mixtape that will take you on a visceral and emotional journey. In fact, the Psalms are sort of a mixtape in themselves. So here's the do's and don'ts of creating a perfect Psalms mixtape. Now the making of a good mixtape is a very subtle art. Many do's and don'ts. I mean, you're taking someone else's poetry to express how you feel. This is a delicate thing. Thanks, John Cusack. Number one, start on a good note. Feel those endorphins? But not all tracks can be sunshine and Psalm 107s. For the next track, I'm thinking of taking things a little deeper. For track two, a sad song for a sad song. Hello darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you. Wow, pulling on the heartstrings. So far, so good. Now we gotta get it out of our system. You know what that means. Number three, get mad. Whew, wow. Well, we gotta complete the range, but we don't wanna end up on that note. Now that our souls are purged and we're feeling a little introspective, we gotta take it back up. Four, epic climax. some good therapy. Now I'm ready to start my day. Or maybe I'm just an emotional wreck. I'm not quite sure how I feel now that I think about it. If only there was a sermon series to help me process some of these. Psalms mixtape. Yeah, give it up. Isn't that fun? So Psalms mixtape, uh, today and the next seven weeks, you're going to be hearing about Psalms from the pulpit here that are powerful and are going to be taught with the passion and the, the, the experience of those who wrote the Psalms. So I'm going to be sharing a Psalm with you today, a Psalm that's really spoken uh, to my heart over time. But remember mixtape, and the idea of a mixtape, as you saw in our video, is that you have the opportunity with a tape, remember the little a rectangle plastic thingies with wheels in them. Some of you remember those? You can still get them at thrift shops in the old bin. Um, and then CDs, and then some of the new devices. But the opportunity you have is to not have to listen to an entire album which has maybe 10 or 12 songs and only four of which you like. You can select the ones you like and put them on your own device or CD or whatever, and it's personal. Every song is for you. It does something for you. Well, we believe that Psalms is God's mixtape for us. That in every one of those Psalms, the, 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 the heart and the passion of those who wrote them is poured out. And it's poured out from their life circumstances. And it's our life now. So you're going to hear more and more about that over time. And so I did. I, I, I prepared a Psalm to share with you. Because this Psalm has great, great depth and meaning to me. So come and listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him and he saved him out of all of his troubles. See, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see 
that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people. For those who fear the Lord lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Do good, turn from evil and do good, and seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. To blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them, and he delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all their bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked, and the foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants, but no one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Psalm 34. That psalm has great power for me in my life. Anyone can do it. <laughs> Psalm 34 became unique to me and special to me many, many years ago. I was going through a tough time. I can't even begin to tell you. I felt brokenhearted. I was crushed in spirit. And, and, and I was reading through the Psalms and I'm thinking, Lord, speak to me something. There's got to be something. This Psalm kept jumping out at me. Psalm 34. And the uncertainty and the unknown in my life at the time, I thought were just going to snuff out the light in me. I really did. And Psalm 34 came. And I could just feel the heart of David as he wrote it. You see, Psalms are poems. They're poems that are meant, they're designed to be sung. They're poems that are meant to be sung. They're not sermons. Even though you can preach great sermons out of Psalms, that isn't their design. And when we read them, we should read them with the passion and the empathy and the power and as best we can, the experience of the person writing the psalm. That's where the potency is. God inspired them in, in very unique and special times in their lives. David wrote most, but other authors wrote them. God inspired them to write from their heart, from their soul, from their gut in this form of expression. And when we read the psalms, we want to capture that. We don't want to just glide right through them and cherry pick a few words. You want to stop for a moment, meditate, pray and say, Lord, give me the spirit of this psalm. They encourage us to praise God and they remind us that he is present in the midst of our troubles. So you see, the book of Psalms is really a hymnal. It is. The Hebrew word for it is tehillim. And what that means is songs of praise. The Greek translation is psalmoi. Psalm O-I, Psalm O-I. And what that means is the plucking of strings with fingers. So, so the best interpretation of the word psalms that we have today is this. Sacred songs sung to musical accompaniment. Sacred songs sung to musical accompaniment. The psalms were not written just to be read alone. And really, if you go on YouTube even now, you can punch in a psalm. And you're going to find somebody somewhere has written music to it. And it's a beautiful, fun thing to do. If you get a chance, go ahead and take care of that. So why music? Why music? Why not just write the words and we'll read the words and that's enough for us? Why music? Because when God designed us, he designed us with this capacity to engage with music in this powerful, deep way that no other form of expression captures what depth of emotion and joy and sorrow through the harmonies and the lyrics and the melodies, especially those songs that have a, a melody hook in us and we just can't, we can't stop singing it. And I don't mean the other songs where you don't like them, but somebody sings it around and you can't get out of your head for two days and you just want to punch them. I don't mean those songs. We are wired to have music. We are wired. I still have a CD my daughter Megan made for me, a mixtape. 
I don't like any of the songs on it. <laughs> they were her songs. It's like I'm listening to them. Going, oh. But she gave it to me because they remind me of her. And whenever I listen to it, I think of my daughter. And that's the goal of this mixtape. Every one of those songs. I have a CD made for me by my wife, Heather. And a couple of years ago, or several years ago, we were just getting to know each other, and we were talking just about who we are, taking just a nice long time to get to know each other. And she learned about my music, and I learned about her music. And then one day, she just surprised me with a CD, and it's really cool because I do like the songs on it. <laughs> and you can dance to some of them. You can kind of get bluesy with some of them, and there's great lyrics and great hooks in it. But it isn't just the music. I've transferred all of it to my iPod. It's that I think of her, my girl, whenever I play that CD. That's how deep it is. Those are the power of these associations. And I'm thinking everyone in this room has interacted with music, maybe even this morning on the way to church, maybe at home when you were getting ready, maybe last night. And I mean, to this day, if you've lived any time at all, you got a bunch of songs in you, more than you know. I still get mushy with the Eagles sometimes. And then I think of the dulcet tones of Luther Vandross just washing over me. And then I think of uh, the Beach Boys, and I think of the Fiddler on the Roof soundtrack. If I were a rich man, sunrise, sunset, matchmaker, matchmaker, and I get all like goofy and like teary when I'm listening to it. And I think of Mercy Me, one of my favorite Christian bands, and I think of Hillsong. And then I think of U2, you know, and I think of just everything. It's more than you can ever imagine when you stop and think about all the music that you have inside of you already. God loves music. He created it for a specific reason, and it helps us worship him even more deeply. So what I want to do now is I want to share one of my mixtapes with you, some of my tunes. You may not like them, and I don't care. I love everything about the ocean. I do. I love being in it. I was diving with my buddy Caleb yesterday, spearfishing. I love sailing on it, boating on it, being near it. I love the smell of it, the sound of it. And I especially love the beach. And when I think of the beach, I think of Surfing USA, the Beach Boys. Oh, yeah. And that takes me right back to the sand at Huntington Beach. And I got, who doesn't like the smell of copper town? Oh, come on. You're lying. You put it on and you smell it and, and, and the salt drying on your skin and you kind of got the burn going and you feel the sand and then you take that long walk from Lifeguard Station 17 up to Zach's Snack Shack at the Huntington Beach Pier in 1967 and you buy what? It was, we had it then, nachos. Is God good or what? And then I like funky music. I've always liked funky music. When I was growing up, my mom taught my brother and I how to dance. She was housebound a lot, and so what we would do is just dance, dance, dance. And some of it was just funky sound, and I grew up liking some really cool stuff by James Brown. I feel good. Oh, yeah. Come on, come on. You know you want to dance. When I watched James Brown, I watched his dance moves. And he had this one dance move he'd do, right? He'd stand on this leg, and he'd move his foot so fast, you couldn't even see it, and he goes across the stage. So I practiced it. I practiced it growing up, and the other day I thought, I'm going to try it out and see if it still works. You ready? Here it comes. <clears throat> you want to see it again? <laughs> you never lose it. You know, you, you never forget these things. And then when I first became a dad... Within weeks, we lived on a small house near the town of Montague, California, by Wairika. A house where you look out the window and Mount Shasta is framed. And I had this beautiful daughter, and when I would go to bed at night and wake up in the morning, I couldn't believe I was a dad, but there I was, and I had this precious little girl right here. And sometimes I just needed to have my turn, and I would dance with her to Isn't She Lovely, Stevie Wonder. Songs in the Key of Life. Isn't she wonderful? Isn't she lovely? To this day, it... See, the power, it still moves me. 
all these years, it still moves me. And then I had an important revelation a couple of weeks ago. My mom was visiting. She was here in church. Thanks to all of you who greeted her warmly. Um, she revealed to me, her son, how she learned about tacos, which is one of the great days in McFadden family history. I was raised in El Monte, California, which is kind of East LA, and we lived in a Hispanic neighborhood. And she told me this, that when I was six and my brother was eight, she went over to my brother's best friend's house, Andy Lopez, and Mrs. Lopez taught my mom how to make tacos. Praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> Just praise him right now. But the music playing in the house had that clave. And you can hear it with, oye, como va, Santana? Bum, 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 bum. Isn't that sweet? Oh, my gosh. Oye, como va? That clave rhythm. And you know what? I read up on this song, oye, como va, the way he has it used in his song is, come, listen to my rhythm. And that's what I love about it, the rhythm. And then some years later, back in 05, 2005, 2006, the family was gathered at my brother's house for uh, his Thanksgiving or the family reunion or something. And he and I are in the living room alone for a little while and everybody's outside playing by the pool and everything. And he loved the Eagles. And so he was playing the Eagles. He had been to their reunion tour. And they started, he started playing this song, Seven Bridges Road by the Eagles with the most beautiful, lush, deep harmonies. And it was so cool because my brother's over there in the chair and I'm here. And we're alone, right? And so he's over there and we, we just feel it so much. So he was doing this face like, like when you haven't eaten in four days and somebody gives you a fresh baked chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> with me, it's a fish taco. But the song's playing, he's going, oh, oh you got it. And I'm over here going, yeah, oh, yeah, I do. I get it. And the kids walk in and say, Mommy, what's wrong with Dad? <laughs> They're having a moment, dear. That was my brother. And then Christian artist Stephen Curtis Chapman praised him because he wrote a song for me. Can you believe that? I'm a diver, and he wrote a song for me. Dive. Stephen Curtis Chapman. I'm, I'm diving in. Oh yeah, I'm diving in. And really that's how I do life anyway. I dive into everything. And that song hit me right between the eyes. I love the beat, I love the rhythm, I love the fun in that song. But he wrote another song later that I have on this, my collection of songs, my mixtape. I was running up Jack's Peak the other day in the middle of the day in the heat because it's hard and stupid. <laughs> and on this this, my little device, is this song by Stephen Curtis Chapman. My Redeemer is faithful and true. Everything, everything he said he will do. My Redeemer is faithful and true. And his, every day his mercies our noon, it just ministers to me when my lungs are burning and my legs are on fire and the sweat's pouring off me and I feel like an idiot. And this song is playing and I just lose myself and my Redeemer. And then he'll song anything. Sometimes there's a Christian song that comes out and we all have our unique taste, but then there's a song that has mass appeal and it just touches us all. And there's a song we used to sing here all the time. Shout to the Lord. And it still moves me. I just praise the Lord when I, ah, oh, to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down, seas will roar at the sound of your name. Beautiful. Beautiful music. Music is so God-given. It's so God-given. Martin Luther said, in 1524, he wrote this. He said, I wish all lovers of the unshackled art of music grace and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. 
I truly desire that all Christians would love and regard as worthy the lovely gift of music, which is a precious, worthy, and costly treasure given to mankind by God. Now, I also love when science confirms and corroborates and supports the truth of God. So I did a little digging around this music thing. What's the science around it? Read a, a review of a study on the BBC website. These researchers were, were surprised by some results when they slid people into an MRI machine, magnetic resonance imaging machine, and played music. They were surprised by what they learned. Areas of the brain having to do with movement, attention, planning, and memory were all activated when music was played, far beyond what they expected from just processing sound. It means God designed it. We are wired for it. Celebrate that. Enjoy that. Embrace that. It's a beautiful thing. So we're talking about music, and psalms are our poems meant to be sung, but what about The psalm itself, Psalm 34, my psalm, the psalm I really believe the Lord gave to me. What about that psalm? Well, one thing I know for sure is this psalm is for you when everything is against you. That was its appeal to me then, and that's its appeal to me now. The psalm is for me when everything is against me. But let's look a little bit about one of the words that happens in this psalm in many different verses and lines in the psalm. The word fear. If we don't unpack it, we can end with seeing fear as just what it seems to mean. You know, frightening, scary. That's not what the word fear means in its use in this psalm at all. What it means in this use is awe, respect, and submission. If you want to fill that in your bulletins, it's right there. Awe, respect, and submission. And I would encourage you, if you read Psalm 34 or any psalms that you read, replace fear with awe, respect, and submission for fear. And Psalm 34 is really about a rock in a hard place. That's really what it's about. See, David, he hadn't ascended to the crown yet. He was anointed, but hadn't ascended yet. So Saul was still king. And Saul had this crazy thing he was doing where he'd say, David, I love your music. This is really great. Thank you for coming. I'm going to kill you now. And David's like, whoa, whoa. And so he'd come back to the court, then he runs, and finally he knows he's got to get out of there. Saul's after him. Saul is bent on killing David. So David escapes the kingdom, and he runs over to a nearby kingdom of the enemies of Saul, the Philistines. He runs to the kingdom of Gath, and there he goes into the court of Achish, the king. And some of your Bibles will say Abimelech, but in this use, Abimelech was a title, like Emperor Julius, Emperor Domitian, Emperor, and Abimelech was the title. Hatchish was the king. And so David's hiding out in his court and he's going, <clears throat> this is good. Yeah, because I'm safe here. Whew. Then he gets word, David, you're in big trouble. They're going to take you out. Now, if we freeze it right there, you might think, well, David being a man of God and the anointed a king who will succeed, Saul probably dropped to his knees and consulted wise people and prayed and asked for God to give him direction. He didn't do any of that. He freaked out. He freaked out. He did. He started dribbling food out of his mouth onto his beard and slobbering all over himself and raving like a lunatic and scratching on the walls and go and all this crazy stuff. They didn't kill crazy people in those days. Crazy people scared him, so he banished David. But he had, God had mercy on David. He didn't kill him, he didn't die. So David runs off to this cave in Abdullam, you know, several miles away, and he joins up with some of his men there, and it is believed that that is where he wrote this psalm. And sometimes we can be in that place in our own life. Something hits us out of nowhere. It could be relational. It could be financial. It could be health. It could be in our neighborhood. It it could be in our family, moms, kids, and family members. It can be anything, and it comes out of nowhere, and it just hits us. And we're frantic in the moment. It's like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And we would be tempted like David to just do something in a moment and react, and that would be us doing it our own way. Our own way. Doing it my way, Frank Sinatra. My way. Sometimes that's a temptation, isn't it? I'm going to do it all my way, God. 
I'll get back to you when I'm in a better space. And he's saying, no, I'm God in the midst of your troubles. No matter what David was thinking, some scholars say he should have waited and he lamented that he didn't. Others say, no, he was cool. He just acted in the moment. Regardless, God delivered him and had mercy on him. So what is Psalm 34 telling us as we walk through David's experience? David praises God and he encourages us to praise God along with him. David calls out to God in anguish, just in anguish, soul-ripping anguish. And we're encouraged to grow in respect and awe and submission. Fear the Lord. We're reminded that he sees us and hears us in our circumstances, in the midst of our troubles. That's who he is, and he's close to us. When the going gets tough, God gets closer. He's close to us in our pain, and he delivers those who turn their face to him. So we can sum Psalm 34 up. I sought the Lord. He answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. He loves you. He's for you. He absolutely is. He will deliver you and save you out of all your fears. In the Gospels, Jesus turns to his disciples and he says something that had to stun them. He says, I call you my friends. My friends. I'm a fall. James Taylor, you've got a friend. God do his call. And I'll be there. Yeah. You've got a friend. Amen. You've got a friend. You have a remote, distant father who's unavailable to you. You've got a friend. Presence in the midst of your troubles. Have you ever uttered David's kind of cry? Have you ever done that? From the bottom of your soul. Something's going on and you just, the light seems like the light's just going to go out. You don't know what you're going to do. In fact, you're so in the moment, shattered and confused, you're living second by second, minute by minute, and you don't even know how you're gonna get through, and your body's shutting down, and your brain's muddled, and you're tired, but you can't sleep. Maybe you've had times like that. I've had a time like that. Many, many years ago, I had lost everything. Moved to a new town, an assignment with the State Department of Health, and my world fell apart, absolutely fell apart. And I was stunned. I, I, I knew a few co-workers. I didn't, I, I didn't know anybody else. My family was 400 miles away. My college friends were 700 miles away. I called one family member and I said, I'm in such pain, I'm in trouble. And they said, well, you'll work it out, goodbye. It made them uncomfortable. I knew I was alone. So I slept in my car for a while. I had to. And I saved up enough to get a little place. I lived with some Vietnamese boat refugees in, in a house there for a while. Then I got my own place, but the pain was unabated. And I just, I, I'd go to work, but I couldn't work. I mean, I'd stare at the wall and I was dropping weight like crazy and I just, I couldn't focus on anything. And I would go home at night and, and I'd be in my apartment. It was a tiny little apartment. I'd just curl up in front of the stereo and weep. It's just what I did. I just thought it's never gonna end. It's never gonna end. And then one day, an album arrived. An album, black disc, put it on a machine that plays it. It was an album called So You Want to Go Back to Egypt by Keith Green. This album was unique because it came from Last Days Ministries in Texas, and you couldn't buy the album. The album could only be sent free, and I didn't know that. I learned all that later. To this day, I have no idea who sent the album to me. But what I did learn is on the back of the album, you can clip the coupon, fill out a name and address, and send it back to Last Day's Ministry. They would send that album anonymously to someone you chose. Somebody chose me to get this album. The Lord was watching out for me. And I thought I knew nobody, and I had no home to go. I had nothing. And this album was delivered to me, and there was a song on this album. There's a redeemer, Jesus, 
Jesus, God's, his own son. Blessed Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. Holy One. And I heard that song, and I know the tune. It's etched in my soul. And right then, when I heard that song and then played it again and again, that little flame that thought it was going to flicker out started to grow. That's who God is. He rescued me. It was nothing that I did. I couldn't have designed that in 100 years. But he did it for me. If, what if you wrote a psalm? What if you wrote one? David isn't the only author of the psalms. What if you wrote a psalm? You know right now, everyone in this room has more than enough life experience in you to write a psalm. Maybe more than one. What kind of a psalm would it be? Would it be only praise? Would it be only lament? Or would it be the imprecatory psalm to say, dear God, ruin that guy. For me, as a favor to me, just ruin that guy. Or would it be designed to teach others how to approach God or how to trust God? Would it be a, a psalm that invited others to worship him alongside of you? Would it be a combination of any and all those things? Would you sing it? Would you create a melody for it? Would you ask God to give you music for it? I wrote a psalm. I had no idea I was going to write a psalm. I had no idea at all. I was sitting in my office weeks ago preparing this message and I was pondering this idea of, you know, we could all probably write a psalm. And I got this nudge from the Lord. And I don't get a two by four. Well, I do get a two, both, two by four in the head several times, but this one wasn't. It was a nudge from the Lord. And I just sort of heard him inside say, well, why don't you write one? You could write one. I said, what? Who said that? He was talking to me. And I wrote the psalm I'm going to read to you in 10 minutes flat. It poured out. I didn't even have to think of it. It just poured out. And now I look and I think, what the heck? How did I, what? That's how he does it. So I'd like to read my psalm to you. It's Psalm 151. There's 150 psalms. So if you do go write your psalm, you cannot use 151. It's mine. I call it Psalm 151, written by Dennis, predictably wrestling with life. Tell me again, O Lord, exactly who you are and that you care. Remind me of your grace that has saved me not once, but countless times in my life. You watch over us all, constantly, patiently waiting for our faces to turn to you. I have wept tears of self-condemnation, while well, you do not condemn. I sing to you, I praise you, I revel in your sweet forgiveness, endless and gracefully offered. Let us all hope in you, rejoice in you, delight in you, and never cease adoring you. Show us your holiness, that we too might be holy and live the best life imaginable. Remember, all you who know him, remember what he has done, all from his great love, freely given. Psalm 151. <laughs> Praise God. So my, my encouragement to you this morning is to read the Psalms. But again, pause a moment and read them with the passion and the power that came from the hearts and souls of those who were inspired to write them. Don't just race through them. Linger. Memorize the Psalms that speak to you. Now, I memorized Psalm 34, right? 22 verses. I was telling staff, and some said, well, that's amazing. That's impressive. 22 whole verses. Why didn't you pick a shorter one? <laughs> and yet we all watch movies, and who goes out of the theater saying, I'm just impressed they all memorized those lines. How do they do that? Do you know it's easier than you think? Memorize one. Memorize one. Then it's yours from the inside out. You don't need a Bible in front of you because sometimes you may not have one, but you'll have the psalm in here. And write your own psalm. Your life is important to God and it's worth a song. It's worth a song. So remember, 
this poor man called and the Lord heard him and he saved him out of all of his troubles. I encourage you to call out to him today. Call out to him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. (laughs) There's nothing in this world beyond you, Father. Even in our darkest times of despair, even loneliness, you are with us. You are for us. You are for us when everything seems against us, Lord God. And we praise you and we thank you, Father. So speak to every heart and mind here because in every chair that has a person in it today, that's a chair with a story in it and the story's still going, Father. And that means they have need of you because they live in this world. So Father, just save us, rescue us, speak to us. Be our God present in the midst of our troubles and in our times of great rejoicing. We pray this together as brothers and sisters. We pray it all in the precious name of the one who gave it all, Jesus Christ, and all together everyone said, amen.